student, uh, Michelle. Yep. This is from my former student, uh, Michelle Fung, um, whose research I'll also talk about in the in the second part. And um, so, the, so they gave a really nice introduction um, last year. And some of my slides in here have been stolen shamelessly from that. Um, although modified mostly by adding colors, I suppose. And then uh, Liz Munch, who's a uh, assistant professor at Michigan State, did a Python tutorial. Um, so, so these two resources are, are, are really nice ones um, if you want to really get into, get into it in more detail than what I'm gonna give. Um, so I want to advertise those. And then there's a bunch of reading material and I'm gonna do this in, in order from most gentle to least gentle in terms of referring you to stuff, or at least within a, sorry, the first slide has the most gentle, but then within the slide, it's not necessarily ordered. And then the second slide will have the second most gentle and so on. Um, there is an introductory article for a very general audience. I think knowing a little bit of linear algebra is probably um, sufficient. And so this article can give a, the big picture. Um, there is a, an article that, that I and some others, so another name that you'll see later on is um, Abby Hickok, who's a current PhD student of mine. So we'll talk a little bit about her work later as well. We wrote an article um, that we published in Frontiers for Young Minds, and this is for teenagers and preteens. So I'm actually gonna take some, some pictures from, from this particular article that I'll show you today. Um, but um, this does not, of course, require linear algebra. So, so this one, this one is, is, is just to get the ideas across. Mm -hmm. um, and there were, for introductory applications, there were a bunch of applications that were discussed, a few different articles by different people in Siam News uh, a couple of years ago. Um, we have an article in there as well. So, so this is the front mm -hmm. of that issue. You can find it online. Um, this one over here is one that we did. So this particular picture, although it's slightly faded, will show up again um, later, but um, this is a sort of popular version of some of the work that, that, that we've done. Um, and then as I said, there's other ones, so like collective behavior over here um, and some various others. So an entire issue um, for sort of general applied math audience. Okay, less gentle, so getting gradually less gentle. Mm -hmm. um, this first paper, uh, so this is by my former postdoc, Nina Otter, who actually was, I actually know her from when she was a PhD student with some others at Oxford. She's now faculty at Queen Mary. Um, and this is a roadmap paper, and it even has tutorials for how to like install and implement the software and so on. So this is more at a research level, but it's at a level that's, that's you know, really gets into the precise mathematics, but also into how to, um, how to implement stuff and the different computation times from different from different software and different examples to get an idea of some choices that one might make for, for which software to use. Right. So this one's now research level, but is but is meant to be is meant to be helpful for people who really want to implement these things for the first time. Mm -hmm. um, there is also a relatively recent review article from a physics perspective. So Gunnar Carlson is one of the people in the mathematical sciences um, who has, who's been a pioneer in these things. And so there's the physics and nature reviews physics paper. And there will be, because we have a draft of this, um, I think it'll come out later this year, there will be a Physics Today article by a few of us at some point. Um, so for the, it's more for the physics community. Um, there's also been a lot of work, including some review articles in the neuroscience community. And um, there's more than just the one I'm gonna to point to here. So I can, I can point you to others if, if there's interest, but the one I'll bring up is the one that I think is more accessible to people who are not mathematicians than, than a couple of the others that I'm aware of. And this is by Anne Sizemore and various others. This comes from um, Danny Bassett's group. So Anne Sizemore was a PhD student of Danny Bassett, is now a postdoc, I don't remember where. And, and so this is now doing it in the context of network neuroscience, uh, which I know is uh, um, of much interest to, to people who are here. Um, so that's another one. So, so a, bunch of different, um, a bunch of different perspectives. Mm -hmm. Okay, getting progressively less accessible, Mm -hmm. um, there are public lecture notes, including videos by Vidit Nanda from University of Oxford, from, from my former department. Um, and this is a sort of intro graduate level class, although 
seniors at, at Oxford are allowed to take it. Um, but it's, this is more for math majors. Um, so if you want to get more of the theory, this will get into more of the theory. And in particular, if you want to get into some of the mathematical ideas that maybe have not yet been implemented computationally, but there's at least some papers about doing it in principle, then this provides um, this provides um, some some sources there. Um, the sort of classical book, and you can find it online for free, um, online for free in a legal way, uh, is by Edelsbrunner and Harer. So, so that's another one that you know. So if you want to have a longer book to go through, and then there's another book um, that's available publicly that can help not just for GDA per se, but for for different types of ideas from from topology. Um, although, as as Rob says, it's actually neither elementary nor applied. So, so the um, the title of the book is a little misleading as to what it what it does, but it's also a free resource mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and has some things in it. Okay, so let's let's now. So I've given you a bunch of resources. Spent a bunch of time on that. Let's now also give a little bit of introduction, motivation, some intuition, a little bit of math, but mostly mostly being intuitive. And the basic idea is that you want to study the shape of data. And I'm putting shape in quotes because the idea is that you you have to somehow say what it means for data to have a shape. And so the doing the mathematics is essentially the answer to the question of, of saying what it means for data to have a shape. Mm -hmm. Okay, so a classical thing in topology, um, and there's a there's a video for people who want to look at these morph each other. And you notice that this is an actual physical object, is to go and transform from a donut to a coffee cup. And you notice that there's this one hole that stays constant, and there's this one connected component that stays constant. So there are invariants. Every single object here has exactly one connected component, and every single object has exactly one hole. So somehow this is a deformation that we are allowed to do. You can actually buy these in different colors. Um, they're somewhat expensive, even though they look nice. Um, okay, so this is one of our pictures. This is Jigglypuff, who is my, uh, well, indignant Jigglypuff is my spirit animal, I suppose. Um, so this is a Pokemon named Jigglypuff. And the thing is, humans are really good at looking at dots like this and saying, I see, you know, in this case, a Pokemon, but I see an object that has definite structure. Humans are really good at this. Yeah. And, and, the, you know, and so what we're trying to do is to have something that's algorithmic that is somehow like what humans are doing very naturally. And so a point cloud is literally a set of points in some space. So pretend these points don't have any area if you want to be literally mathematical about it. So it's a set of points in some space, in this case in 2D. Um, and we say, OK, well, how do we describe the shape of the structure? There are things in here that we want to describe as holes. And so TDA, the purpose of TDA is to come up with a way to do it. Or in particular, the purpose of persistent homology is to come up with a way to do it. OK, that's Jigglypuff. So what we do, this comes from the, um, this comes from our Frontiers for Young Minds paper. We are thickening the dots. So imagine that these dots are getting progressively thicker. And as you do so, the number of components is getting smaller. Mm -hmm. um, and the number of, of holes at first will increase because if I look at this, this original one, I, there's not actually any hole here because only my eyes are filling it in, but eventually these dots overlap and you start getting some holes and the, the picture looks, you know, like what, what we were doing anyway with our own eyes. And, and then eventually it starts getting worse, right? So it gets better and then it gets worse and components last for a certain amount of time. They have a lifetime and holes last for a certain amount of time. Um, and we want to do this in a mathematical way. This one does actually correspond to a well-known mathematical construction known as a Via Torres Rips construction. Um, so we're taking dots and we're thickening point clouds and we have certain number of components. So we said pieces here, but number of components. Um, and we have certain numbers of holes, which originally is zero, it goes up and then it goes down. And eventually you just get a blob. Um, when we're counting these in, in the context of, mathematic, uh, of mathematics, they're known as Betty numbers. The number of components is H naught, which is um, the which is well. So this is the num This is the rank of a certain what's called a homology group. So this is analogous to a dimension of a vector space, but because it's an algebraic group structure, it's a rank. Um, so this is this gives you the number of components. So this would be H naught, and then the number of holes is H one. 
Okay, so what we want are algorithmic, me algorithmic methods to study high dimensional data. We wanna do it quantitatively. We want to do it ideally quickly because this stuff can scale. Um, point clouds are the sort of most natural setting that people study. So I showed you an example there, but there's been a number of studies with, with networks where you might start with a network. There have been studies where you start with images. There have been studies where you start with time series. It could be coupled time series or it could be a single time series. So, so the data can come in different forms. Mm -hmm. um, and we want to somehow examine the shape of it. And the way that we're going to do this is with persistent homology by as a function of something. And in our case, it's a function of, um, show me the one I want to show. It's a function of say the radius of these dots, but it could be a function of something else. In this case, it's a function of the radius of the dots. How do, do the topological invariants, so number of holes, number of components, number of higher dimensional versions of holes, which are called voids, how do those things change as a function of some parameter, right? So from a physics point of view, you could think of it as an order parameter, but it's a different type of order that we're, that we're measuring. And how long do holes last, or how long do structures last? Because there's an issue of if, if a structure lasts for only a very small amount of time, you know, maybe it's noise as opposed to signal. Um, so this is a meant, meant to be a way to cope with noise and data. Okay, and then this is also a way to look at what are called polyadic or higher order structures that are going beyond pairwise, which is one reason why people in networks have gotten interested in it, since the most standard networks paradigm is pairwise. Okay. In the context of networks, it's often used for weighted networks. You do what's called a filtration. That's what gives you your parameter that's varying. So if, for example, I have a weighted network, I could filter by the weights and say, okay, I am going to look at a series of networks, sequence of networks. First, I have one with only the highest weighted edge. Then I have the ones with only the two highest weighted edges and so on in sequence. That's one way of doing it. And so you're thresholding at each point, but you're actually keeping every possible network in the, in the threshold rather than only doing one. And so you have this stack of networks and you want to ask which structures stay the same across networks and which ones change. Um, so this is, this is a way to look at global structure and networks, but it's a complement to more sort of traditional ones like clustering. Um, and you can, you can also do this in, in other ways. All right, I am taking much longer than I thought I would on that part, but hey. Okay, yeah. All right, it's all right. Um, I can skip a couple of slides if I need to. So algebraic topology is the key underlying mathematical subject. Mm -hmm. So this is, I showed you this plot before. So we want to describe properties of an object that stay the same. We are allowed to stretch it. We are allowed to shrink it. We are allowed to bend it, mm -hmm. but we're not allowed to glue things together and we're not allowed to tear it. Okay, so you can deform the coffee cup into the donut. We're allowed to do that, but I cannot smash my coffee cup in the ground. Not that I would ever want to do that anyway. <laughs> and we say that two objects are topologically equivalent if you can transform them to each other in this way, right? So mathematically, you would say, oh, here is a, here is a map with appropriate smoothness properties, and, and anything that can be transformed under that map is considered to be equivalent from that perspective. There are, and, and we seek topological invariants, in this case, number of components, number of holes. Um, holes in different dimensions, so hole starts going in quotes. And what we're looking at here technically, technically are called homological invariants, but there are also other types of topological invariants. Mm -hmm. And the type of TDA that would be nice to do in the future, if we can figure out good ways to do it, is to get good ways of computing um, topological invariants other than homological invariants. For instance, maybe based on homotopy or based on other relationships. So different things that you're allowed to do, but the objects are considered to be, to be the same based on doing it. Okay, but we're considering this one. Okay, so then there's an idea called the simplicial complex. So we are going to take continuous things and approximate them with discrete things. And we're gonna do this with simple simplices. So we have a K-dimensional polytope that is a convex hull with K plus one vertices. So you could have a node or you can have an edge that connects two nodes or you can have a filled in triangle or you can have a filled in tetrahedron and so on. Um, and then an M face is a subset of M plus one, size M plus one, and it's M simplex itself. So this is a generalization of the idea that the triangle is a face of the tetrahedron and the edge is a face of the triangle. Yes. And then a simplicial complex is a set of simplices 
that satisfies two conditions. One is that every face of a simplex in S, so it's a set of simplices, and any face is also there. So if the tetrahedron's there, then the associated triangles should also be there. Mm -hmm. um, and then if you have a non-empty intersection of any two simplices, that has to be a face of both. Mm -hmm. So I don't show a picture of that here, um, but but the intersection has to be a face in both in 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 in, in both. This is a picture on Wikipedia that I have used many times. I put it in an article. I've seen other people do it as well. It's actually quite a nice picture. This is an example of a simplicial complex. Okay. And so for persistent homology, we want to use ideas from algebraic topology and predictive homology to analyze data. I still have to tell you what the word persistent means. I, I, I've shown you, but I haven't really used that word. So the basic workflow is like this. You start with a data set. You create your topological objects from the data set. So choose, choosing a radius, for instance, um, in, in, in Jigglypuff. You construct the homology groups. You have to fix your parameter value to construct the group. Mm -hmm. And what you want to look for are things that are similar, uh, that, 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 stay, that persist across different parameter values. So in the case of Jigglypuff, it would be features of Jigglypuff that exist for large radius ranges. Those are what you're supposed to consider to be actual features. OK. But the calculations, the reason you can make sense of it topologically is that you fix your radius, or you fix your other parameter, and you compute your topology for that fixed parameter. And then you do this for each one. So you can approximate spherical cheese by a tetrahedron. <laughs> This is from uh, Bernadette Stoltz, who is a um, former master student of mine, is now a postdoc at Oxford. Um, and this, this, is a, this is a neuro paper. I'm not going to talk about this paper too much, but it's a neuro paper. So I know in terms of subject matter, this may be of interest to the audience. But you could also do another type of cheese, and you have a more complicated simplicial complex. Um, so instead of spherical cows, we have like you know tetrahedral cheeses. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, this figure is actually in the paper. It was, it was very nice. Um, Bernadette's part Swiss, so this is where she got this from. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so what we're constructing is known as a filtered simplicial complex, or also colloquially known as a filtration, and you have a sequence of simplicial complexes. So S0 would be, say, the point cloud itself, would literally be the point cloud itself, and Sn would be this larger one, and you have this nestedness. So you have this nestedness property, and you can think of each SI as looking at the data set at a different scale. So think of S0 as epsilon equals zero in the picture I showed you earlier, and S1 is some small value of epsilon, and S2 is some slightly larger value of epsilon until epsilon is so, so large that you just get a blob and can't see anything. And these are nested inside each other. And so then you ask yourself, well, which structures exist for a large, range, a large number of values of I? So these are discrete sets of epsilons. So it's epsilon one, epsilon two, and 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 so on. So you pick so, so you so you pick this increment. So what we did with Jigglypuff is known as a Viatoris Rips filtration. It does correspond to an actual one. You fix the value epsilon, and for each point in the point cloud, you center a ball of radius epsilon. And whenever k plus one of these balls all overlap, you create a k simplex. Okay, and then the simplicial complex is the set of those the set of those k simplices. And then you increment epsilon, and you do the same thing. OK, so incrementing epsilon, you do the same thing. Increment epsilon, do the same thing. And then you, you, can, you look at the structure of all of these, and there's, there's nice mathematical relations that cross these, and I'm not showing you those. But essentially, there are theoretical results that say, I am allowed to do this. I mean, of course, there's a more precise mathematical statement than that. But more or less, the collection of theory says, I am allowed to do this. Um, and then you, you then 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 it starts becoming a more data analysis type of task at that point. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is exactly doing this is the same picture as before. It's exactly doing via torus rips. So S naught, S one, S two, S three, and so on. And by the time we get to here, well, okay, there's lots of stuff there. It's not very helpful, but you know, certain things like this is a feature, and this is a feature, and this is a feature. But then other stuff, well, not so much. Mm -hmm. Uh, let's see. In the interest of time, okay, I, I mentioned you can do it in networks. 
Betty numbers are what H0 and H1 are called. They're just known as Betty numbers. Okay, so one thing we care about very deeply are the birth and death of features. And you say that a feature is born at a certain I, so a certain value of epsilon, if this is the smallest value of I for which a feature exists. And a feature dies, if it is the largest value for which the feature exists. So you have a birth time and you have a death time. Some things won't die. Some features will live forever. Or forever really means you stop tracking it, right? So you don't know what happens afterwards. But then you say, all right, this feature did not die in the set of things that I looked at. Um, and then there are various ways to visualize this. Um, so there's also a lot, a lot of research on, well, given that I've done this, how should I visualize it and what properties do they have? And there's two that I'll show you. Um, because I'm going to be using using them in the next slide. Um, one is known as barcodes because uh, it reminds of barcodes if you buy something like in a market, and the other is known as persistence diagrams. But there's several others as well. Um, it's quite a few others. So, um, just as a note, because I'm not going to actually explain why it's true, but I'll mention it because it might be of interest. Persistence diagrams tend to be um, to work a little bit better with some machine learning type stuff than barcodes. So if you're going to be doing machine learning afterwards, that might be a reason to use persistence diagrams rather than barcodes. And uh, just there's certain distances that one can define and like there's and do that. And then you can say, okay, now that now that I have a distance matrix, I can cluster. Okay, this is what barcodes look like. The the horizontal axis here is different from the one um, that I've been describing. So this will show up later, but just think of this as the, the radius of the balls um, for, for, for Jigglypuff. And H0 is the number of components, and H1 is the number of holes. And so the bar starts when some, so here's a saying that a hole would first form over here, and that hole would die over there. Um, if two things die at the same time, or if one thing dies while something else is born, they're kind of, Sorry, yeah, please, yeah. yeah. There can, so there can so if something there there are examples you can construct that can have some ambiguity as to what dies and what does not. So there's some technical things that one might have to deal with. But in general, a feature is born. In this case, a hole. A feature dies. Components, you know, feature is born. Feature dies. Um, so the left endpoint is the birth. The right endpoint is the death. Um, you can calculate the lifespan with the death minus birth and the sort of standard intuition. Although one has to worry about this. Uh, and I will describe in the second part an example of why. Um, but the, the sort of ca the canon is that longer features are more persistent, uh, or sorry, longer persistent features are literally more persistent. But the canon is that more persistent features are signal and less persistent features are noise. Uh, so persistence diagrams, and I'm conscious of time, give the same information as um, barcodes. But we're doing it differently. We're now doing birth death as coordinates instead of bars. So birth is on the horizontal axis and death is on the vertical axis. The pink circles, um, not that you can tell that they are actually circles, are for components. The blue squares are for are for holes. Um, you will actually later on see what data set this one came from. But something over here, this means that this that this particular component was born at, say, this was at two and it died at three. Right, so it only existed. It only existed for two in this particular um, calculation. Mm -hmm. So you can have these components, and this is the object where you can calculate distances between different persistence diagrams, and and then you have a distance matrix, and then you can do lots of th things you're familiar with. Okay, so summary. Um, so topological data analysis can give insights. I have not really shown you insights yet, but I've hopefully given intuition for it. Um, networks and other complex systems, I focus more on the other complex systems in particular point clouds. It uses ideas from the subject of algebraic topology. I gave you a hint of that. I showed you a little bit of the math, but there's actual theorems there that I have not shown you. Um, and topologically, this gives a meaningful way to study the shape of data. Okay, so that's the first part. Okay. Did we want to pause for any questions before going to the second part? Yeah, they'll be good. So uh, any quick question before we begin the uh, colloquium? Anything is fine, yeah. If you have a question, just you can unmute and you can ask the question or you can leave the question in chatting room. It's also fine to leave questions for, for, um, 
for, for later as well, if, if you prefer, or to email me or whatever you'd like. So Mason, usually um, you, um, the, uh, the radius is a, a user, uh, typical way to change the uh, construct of a uh, uh, series of S. Yeah, that's that's the most common way. Mm -hmm. um, um, and um, it's not the only way. I mean, in fact, one of the things that, and this is one thing I'm hoping to convey in the in the second part, mm -hmm. is that you really want to use information from the problem that you're studying for how you choose to do it, because mm -hmm. that's really one way that you can bring in your knowledge of the domain. And if you only just do it in a, in a standard way, like by using software and not being careful, then you might do something that's not actually appropriate for the problem you're studying. Um, and then there was a question in the chat. Um, yeah, pers persistent diagrams are better um, for machine learning than, than barcodes, um, basically because you can define a proper distance in an unambiguous manner, even though the information itself is technically the same. Um, the second question was, are there TDA methods for analyzing time series? Yes, there are. This is not something that I have um, personally worked on using time series methods, mm -hmm. but there's there's sort of two classes of methods. There's classes of methods that would work on coupled time series, mm -hmm. and there's classes of methods that would work on a single time series. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, Elizabeth Munch, who, who's, whose tutorial I mentioned earlier, is one person who has done a bunch of work on that. Um, and so if you look up her work, that will be a way to, to start. But but yeah, um, there are people who have who have done that in different ways. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's another question. Is it similar to popular techniques of nonlinear dimensional reduction, LLE isomap, are they somewhat related to it? Um, so I don't actually know what LLE is, to mm -hmm. be honest. Um, I, I have used isomap a little bit before. They are different. Um, that's an interesting question of whether there's a relation. The short answer is that I don't know, but I wouldn't be surprised if using one of them to study the other would find something interesting. I just don't know what that interesting thing is. And I don't know if someone's done it before. It's an understandable question to ask, but but yeah, I, I don't know. I see. Okay, thanks for all answering the question. So then uh, maybe, <clears throat> yeah, why don't we uh, begin the uh, official talk? Um, uh, so yeah, uh, Taegyun Kim, maybe we can, uh, we will have a Q&A session after the colloquium talk, so you can ask that question later, please. Okay. <coughs> okay, so should I just go start then? Uh, oh, no, 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 uh, let me introduce you one more time, sorry. Okay. Yeah. No, so, no problem. Like, there are some people to come. Um, <coughs> Okay, so um, uh, I have the great pleasure of introducing uh, Professor Mason Porter as today's uh, BIMAC colloquium speaker. Uh, in a series of landmark studies, uh, Dr. Porter has developed novel mathematical and computational method for diver for diverse areas such as uh, nonlinear dynamics, network analysis, and mathematical biology. And Dr. Porter was a faculty of uh, Oxford uh, previously and currently a uh, professor of mathematics at UCLA. Uh, he is also the fellow of SIAM uh, AMS, and uh, he is also uh, selected as a, a highly cited researcher in a cross field category. And his uh, most recent work and the topic of his talk today is. Uh, topological data analysis of Spathier system. So please join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Porter one more time. Thanks very much. Yeah, again, I really appreciate um, <coughs> the invitation. Um, I look forward to visiting Korea in person again. I have yes. I've been there before a couple of times, but the last time was for the um, uh, around the statistical physics conference time in, in 2013. So it's oh. been quite a it's lot. It's been a long time now, so hopefully, hopefully soon. Yes, um, after okay. this pandemic. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I'm not making as many travel plans as I used to, so I, yeah. I don't want to give a year, but I, I look forward to coming again. Yeah, I please. Really yeah, yeah, please. Yeah. Um, okay, so spatial systems, which is something that I've looked at from a few different perspectives. So there's some, there's some plots here. Actually, um, 
So I know I saw Sung Hoon in the in the audience. So he will recognize a couple of these um, from from work that he's been involved in. Um, so so space has a major influence on the structure of, of networks and other complex systems. And one place, if you want to. Uh, if you want to learn about that from various perspectives, there's a book by Mark Bartholomew from a few years ago. The thing is, spatial systems themselves are already quite diverse. Mm -hmm. So this is quasi 2D granular materials. Um, and you can see that there, well, it's hard to see, but there's actually two different radii of particles. And they're connected to each other, but they also have these forces, these force chains. Uh, so brighter is, is higher forces that take this complicated structure and there's different size scales of things in between. You can also have things like um, epidemic um, um, transmission in space. So this is dengue fever in, in, in Peru. I'm not really explaining how this came from, but uh, that is from that. Um, there is a rabbit warren. You can have different space like in, in, where animals live, um, fun, fungal networks. Um, city streets, the metro, metropolitan systems sponsored by IKEA, um, brain networks. Uh, again, this is something that's familiar to I know number of people in this audience. So just to show a couple of them, just to again illustrate the diversity. Uh, so this is work, actually Ig Nobel Prize winning work by my collaborator Mark Fricker and his collaborators. Mm -hmm. um, this is um, showing how a fungal network grows by putting kind of food sources at the locations of, 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 of cities um, in Japan, or, or there may be parts of Tokyo, this, yeah, anyway, locations in Japan and, and getting something like the train system that, that resembles the train system growing as a result um, so the food sources were put at the location of stations. Wow. Um, but you have, you have some structure here. Um, and I should say fungal networks have been studied. And in fact, it was fungal networks from this particular data set, which, which comes from work with Sung Hoon and others, have been studied using TDA. Um, another, another spatial system that's been studied using TDA are leaf venation patterns. This comes from Eleni Katafori and her collaborators. And again, you have different structures here, but it, even though it exists in space, and even though it's, so this is a sort of curved 2D manifold, um, you still have very different structures than is the case of the fungus and with fungal networks. The, this is always my favorite example, and we're going to get more detail about this one later. This one is spiders spinning webs while under the influence of various drugs. You'll notice the, the one under caffeine, this is where I have my sip of coffee. Oh, the one under caffeine is having all sorts of trouble, the one with sleeping pools as well. Um, so I'll come back to this data set and give the story, the story behind it. There's something in the chat. Ah, okay. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, um, another, another thing is, um, you can look at the border between countries can sometimes be very complicated. This is the border between Belgium and the Netherlands at, um, well, depending on which country you're in, Barley, um, Barl Nassau or Barl Hertog. And this is not a simply connected border, right? So if you're if you're in beige, you are in the Netherlands, but if you're if you're more goldish, you're in Belgium. And so this is a very complicated border between the two countries. Um, there are other less extreme versions of this that actually show up in a study that I was in, involved in. This one's a little bit more a little bit more complicated. Um, okay, so I talked about this for for a little while, but just to remind you, and I know that some people came in and were in, um, for, for the, this talk only, so topological data analysis is an algorithmic method to study um, high dimensional data in a quantitative manner. And the data could come from point clouds or networks or images or time series or whatever. We want to examine the shape of data. So this is a way to make sense of the notion of shape of data. And in particular, the most popular way of doing it is known as persistent homology. So persistent is supposed to last over a large range of parameter values, and homology is holes, literally holes. Um, and um, this is then giving a mathematical formalism for studying topological invariance. There are fast algorithms, and then persistent structures are a way to cope with noise in data. Mm -hmm. um, can also allow examination of higher order interactions in data. So I'm going to show you this one just to remind you 
of what we had just talked about. You could say have a point cloud. This picture is much less blurry than the one I put there earlier, so I should have used this <laughs> same figure. This one's just less blurry. So imagine that each point is occupying infinitesimal space, and we thicken it from A to B to C to D to E to F, and the number of points is going down, and the number of holes goes up and then goes down. And the question is, which of these features, holes or or or, or components? last for a large number of values of the radius of these dots. And so homology is the is, is you are counting the number of components and holes and so on, but which ones last for a while? Okay, so I went through that fast, the long introduction. Normally I'd have a couple more minutes of explaining what that is. So here's something that we did. And so this is work by my former student, uh, Michelle Fung, who's now a postdoc at, at Caltech. And we published this last year in Siam Review. Um, Michelle got a Siam Student Paper Prize for this paper. And this, this does geospatial data. And the thing that we did in there, um, and this is going to be an important part of kind of the theme, we constructed our what are called filtrations. So instead of using these different values of epsilon in a point cloud, we constructed it in a way that was helpful for this data set. And that's what allowed us to, to learn something about this data. And that was more meaningful for this data than just doing point clouds or just doing radius of dots. Mm -hmm. And the goal in this particular paper is that we want to quantify what are called political islands. And so maybe to detect red voters in a sea of blue, or perhaps even to detect light blue voters in a sea of dark blue. Um, this is Alameda County in the 2016 election. This is Tulare County. So the counties are different from each other. The one on the left looks in principle a lot bluer than the one on the right. And maybe there are, are, are holes here. Um, you know, visually, it looks like there should be holes. And can we use a uh, topological method to detect those holes quantitatively and not just rely on our eyes? Um, redder precincts are ones that have a higher fraction of voters who voted for Donald Trump. And bluer precincts are ones that have a higher fraction of voters that voted for Hillary Clinton. So a dark red precinct was something that, that Trump won by a large margin. And a dark blue precinct, um, Here's a dark blue precinct is one that Hillary Clinton won by a, a large margin. Okay, so this is precinct level voting data. This is public data. It was from um, a project from the Los Angeles Times, and there's a lot more data than what we use. We were just looking at the presidential election, but there's also there were also um, other elections. And so, if you want to study election data at a much finely, more finely grained level than what's normally available, usually you'd get like more like. Um, I don't know, like district level or something. Precincts are smaller than districts. So, so this is really finely grained compared to what you can normally get. This may be a data set that interests you for various other reasons. So the question is, how do people vote? Can we identify, in our case, geographical patterns, but one would also be interested normally in temporal patterns. Um, you have to worry a little bit about temporal patterns because the boundaries can change and then you have to figure out a way to deal with it, which um, as I know from personal experience can be a nightmare. Um, and you know, one question is, can we automatically characterize some outliers? Okay, so this is from California, every single precinct in California compiled by the LA Times. You can download that. Okay, so topological methods are in general good for finding and identifying holes as long as we have a nice enough space to search for those holes. Mm -hmm. And they also allow us to relate the presence of these holes to global structure. Okay, so in general, topology does that. So we want to find political islands, and we were going to think of them as holes in a manifold in which all precincts vote similarly. So, um, well, this one has a bit of a boundary here, but you know, maybe we should think of that red one or as, as a hole, um, or this dark blue one certainly seems like a hole with respect to light blue ones, right? So it's different from the things that surround it. I see. And maybe we can also say something about the structure of, of a county. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm going to show you a couple slides that I that I showed you in the in the first part for those of you who are there. So so one way to look at um, um, the output is, is barcodes and the strength of preference. So this one actually comes from this particular paper. Um, so it's no longer meaning the radius. It's now saying more people voted say for Clinton, and or this is Clinton minus my, Clinton minus Trump. Um, so more voted for Clinton, not as much, not as much, not as much and so on. 
And this would be components. The first part, H0 is a number of components. This is Betty 0. H1 is Betty 1 is a number of holes. So um, maybe a political island forms here and dies there. Strength of preference will be one way you measure it. I'll get more detail later. So the barcodes give us a way of visualizing the output of a, of a persistent homology calculation. Each interval is a single feature in dimension n. I think I forgot to mention that last time. But this is one feature. This is another feature. This is another feature, and so on. The left endpoint is the birth. The right endpoint is the death. And visually, longer features are more persistent. And then the question is going to be, well, when does more persistent actually mean signal? Right, because mm -hmm. that's that's the common wisdom. But remember, I'm I was mentioning one has to be careful. And then another way of visualizing the same the same output, um, two of many different ways, are persistence diagrams. And so now instead of having a barcode, we are now doing coordinates. So this one over here was born at one, and died at looks like twelve. This is a component that was born at one and died at twelve, and. This one is a um, is a hole that was born at, at four and 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 died at twelve. Okay, um, so the and you notice that we have a diagonal line. It's not possible to be below the diagonal line with these particular coordinates. Okay, the height and then the height above the diagonal line would indicate the lifespan, which is which is the persistence. Okay. So distance-based constructions, and I showed you an example of a distance-based construction earlier. In particular, I showed you the via torres rips construction, which is thickening the point cloud. You surround each point cloud. So these, so these are standard ones that are implemented in software. Um, you surround each point cloud with a ball, each point with a ball of radius epsilon, and you look at what happens as you increase epsilon. You can think of epsilon as, um, uh, as an order parameter. Um, and then for a set of n plus one points, if the pairwise distance between any two of them is less than epsilon, you build an n simplex. So you look at what overlaps and you connect and you, you, you connect all the edges between all the ones that overlap and you connect all the simplices and so on. So if there's three points that overlap, you connect them pairwise by edges, but you also connect the triangle. Mm -hmm. And so then we have then a simplest or complex at x, x epsilon. But then we have a set of these. So we have x epsilon sub one and x epsilon sub two and so on. And these are nested with each other. And so we build them that way. And so as epsilon gets larger, we get larger and larger simplicial complexes. This VR complex can get extremely computationally intensive, which shouldn't surprise you given that you're saying, oh, pairs of nodes, pairs of dots, triples of dots, quadruples of dots. Right, you can you can you can see that this is going to scale in, in terrible ways. Mm -hmm. um, so for for larger things, when this becomes long, there are approximations that people use to to do the computations. Um, and in particular, there's something called the alpha complex, which is constructed in a somewhat different way, but still has the basic idea of distance. And in 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 the paper um, that I'm describing. We, for distance-based constructions, we use the VR complex when we can, but for some of the larger counties, we ended up using an alpha complex for, for reasons of computational time. So here is an output of, of running the alpha complex on two-layer. I showed you two-layer earlier. And so we look at this visually and think, well, you know, are we seeing anything in the middle of this that looks like, you know, um, islands, political islands. And I guess the answer to this is sort, sort of. We see some stuff, maybe we're detecting stuff, but it's, it's really not clear if we're, get, if we're getting it. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then a summary. So because this one's essentially gonna not be the right way to approach this particular problem is what's gonna end up happening. So the advantage is it's easy to construct. Mm -hmm. There are fast algorithms, so fast as a relative thing. It's built into many packages. So if you're using software, um, via Torus rips and usually alpha are like, they're built in. Um, it's easy to interpret because, okay, think of this picture of, of Jigglypuff and, and the radius of the ball increasing, right? The, and, and then having things overlap. That has an easy interpretation. And then parameter selection is just, okay, long, long values of epsilon or ranges of epsilon where features exist. Um, 
However, there are disadvantages, you know, which values are actually appropriate. Persistence doesn't always measure what we want it to. In particular, it's not measuring what we want to here. It is sensitive to distant scales. Okay, what do I mean by that? So some precincts are physically much larger than others. Mm -hmm. But if what I really care about is the fraction of people who voted a certain way, it is not the size of the precinct that I want drowning out everything else. And, and, and so there's, there's, there's geographic distance here that's getting in the way, and I'm using a distance-based construction that, that cares about geographic distance. So, so there's an issue that I'm measuring something different from what I actually care about, um, and then requires data in point cloud form. Well, one often has that, but that's not, that's not always the case. Um, so here's where I get on my soapbox and, and mention something a bit, because this happens a lot. So this stuff is built into the software. And then a lot of people who are doing TDA will do a calculation of sort of a standard one from a software. And then they'll say, oh, well, you know, long persistence, long lifespan means it's signal and short lifespan means it's noise. But then they're doing a computation that may not be the right computation for the problem they're studying. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and so then you start getting these interpretations that are that with constructions that are not respectful to the problem you're studying. And, and so this is an issue. Right, so it's nice that it's built into the code, and so it's a good way to get started. But you really want the way you're constructing it, so your order parameter, to be respectful of the problem you're studying. So, okay, uh, here's the, uh, okay. in the uh, the each I guess each count will be the point, and then how do um, you distinguish the blue each, and red? Each precinct is a point. Uh huh. Uh -huh. Um, so this particular one, this particular particular construction is not doing a good job of distinguishing blue and right, red because right, we're, right. we're, not, we're not directly using that information. Uh -huh. We do have the fact that these parts are different uh -huh. and we do occasionally get the right answer from this stuff. Um, but, but this particular case is just literally starting like over here and building a ball of, of, of radius epsilon. Mm -hmm. And there's a ball of radius epsilon here and we're looking when things overlap. Mm -hmm. So you can get the boundaries between things um, but not necessarily whether or not it's blue or red. So I would say that whenever this one works, it works by accident for this particular problem. Yeah, I mean, the, the main reason to do that one was just to do the standard, include the standard one and explain why it's not appropriate for this particular um, application. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we developed two new constructions um, in, in our paper. And when I say new construction, what this means is new ways of doing the sequence, um, S0 contained in S1, contained in the contained in SN, new things of doing the filtered simplicial complexes. So new ways of thinking of an order parameter if you want to do this in, in, in physics language. So one way of doing it was to use notions of network adjacency. Um, so we put, we have each precinct as a node. And if, if N plus one nodes, of the ones that we're keeping, I have to tell you how we're keeping them, are pairwise adjacent. We define an N simplex. So if I keep two adjacent precinct, precincts, then I would put an edge between them. If I keep three adjacent precincts, then I would put a triangle. Um, there's an additional thing that you need. And namely, the thing that you need is either data on the nodes or the edges. So you have to have some way of ordering either the nodes or the edges. In this particular paper, it was the nodes. And so we ordered them by, by preference for candidates. So, so say we keep all the, the precincts that have the voted say at least 95% for Clinton. So those are all the nodes that exist. And we look at all the nodes that, are exi that exist and we, and we define um, these simplices. And then, say, then we say, okay, well, we did that for 95%. Now let's say we do 90%. So there's more nodes that exist than before. And then we define the simplices. And the second one has more than before. So the first, so, so it's a superset of the, of the first one. And so we get this nested, this nested construction that we need. And we keep doing that um, as we lower the percentage, which lowers the, the requirement for which nodes we keep when we're doing this. So this filtration doesn't care about distance at all. It only cares about which nodes we keep. And we're using the ordering on the node data to determine which nodes we keep. 
So this was intuitively what we thought would work the best and it works okay. It's not gonna turn out to be the best of the ones we tried for this particular thing, but it's, it's, the, one, it's the one that we thought would work the best. Um, I'll show you something from it in a, in a bit. So it doesn't care about distance at all. It only cares about adjacencies of, of, of the precincts. Um, and this is nice when there isn't any sort of natural way to put something in Euclidean space and just, you know, because it only cares about relative location. Um, okay, now the first disadvantage is a little bit of an odd way of phrasing. It still only works on discrete data. Um, one can have arguments as to if data is always discrete or whatnot, but anyway. I'm listing it there. It is sensitive to choices of construction of the underlying network. So I was using a particular type of adjacency. In particular, you can think of queen adjacency which, uh, versus rook adjacency, for instance. But you're, you know, you're making a choice as to what it means to be adjacent. And then you're saying, well, which nodes are then present? And so that choice might affect things. Mm -hmm. um, and then it requires some other data. You have to have a way of ordering either the nodes or the edges. In this case, I showed you an example with nodes to be able to construct this in a meaningful way. So there's an extra bit of information that somehow has to be there. Okay, here's another construction that we came up with. And this, and this is gonna end up being the one um, that worked the best among the ones we tried. And it has a via torus rips type idea. So there's still this notion of thinking um, but we're going to use a level set method um, from, from, from front propagation. Um, so we're going to actually start with data in a surface form or more, more properly in a manifold form. We're going to take all precincts with similar voting patterns. So what we'll say is, so I think what we, what we actually did in the paper is to say, well, if they all voted, say, majority for Clinton, let's keep all those and see what happens. And then the complementary one, if they all voted majority for Trump, let's keep those. But you could imagine doing this in different ways. Right. So, so you define some notion of what it means to be similar enough. You keep those. So you're not starting with a point cloud. You're starting with a set of a set of disjoint potentially regions. And then you consider the outer contour to be the level set of the function being equal to zero of some 3D object. And you evolve this surface on a triangular grid according to a PDE for front propagation. Um, one interesting thing that people could try to do, it's not something we did in this particular paper, but it would be an interesting mathematical direction is to try different PDEs that are up for front propagation. We use this one because there's a lot of methods to solve this quickly. Um, my colleague, Stan Osher, has spent 30 years studying the level set method in various ways, level set equation. And so we had expertise, you know, literally down the hall. And mm -hmm. so we did it that way. Um, it's front propagation in one direction. So we get nestedness properties. So if we propagate it, this one is not so interesting, but we start from these two purple regions. Um, um, so this is a map of Trump voting counties in Imperial County. So we start with these two purple regions and we expand the purple regions, um, thinking of a surface, a 3D surface moving, moving up and down. And so these gradually expand and they eventually hit the boundary and so on. Um, and then we take the collection of filled grid cells to be two simplices uh, with the grid lines as the edges and points to be vertices. Um, the fact that we're using a triangular grid is also another issue that one that one might that one might discuss. But um, uh, TDA methods like triangles. These, these these methods. There are other there are some other methods, but most of the methods tend to like triangles. And then now the filtration parameter is time. Mm -hmm. As you let the PDE flow, this surface. So this it's two destroyed things, but this flows outward. And we just track things as a function of time. So it's thickening, but it's 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 front propagation. Okay, so level set method, which is solving that PDE, is a very fast method for doing it. The persistence is going to correspond to the size of a feature. Larger holes will take longer to fill. Remember, the adjacency complex did not care about that, right? So we're recovering some notion of size, and we're still thickening. Um, but we're starting with a manifold. So we're starting, right? we're not starting with a set of points, but we're actually starting with these two purple objects, for instance. Okay, so I'm going through this quickly at this point, but this is what paper is for. So an advantage here is that we still can use an underlying shape of a map. 
we have some notion of geographic size via the mesh size. And for the large data sets, um, for large data sets, it actually was faster than the sort of standard VR method, which is starting with points. Okay, disadvantage. It's difficult, this is in general a hard thing. It's difficult to associate the generators of holes with the original precincts on the map. So there are algebraic generators and, and you can see that there is a hole, but sort of figuring out basis elements ends up, that's not easy. Mm -hmm. um, if your data set's less granular, it may not be so great. It can get confused by things like bodies of water. So, so there are, you know, I'm hoping that people will build on this because this, you know, this is the first paper that was using this particular approach, but there's no reason to think that one can't improve it a lot. Mm -hmm. So there are some issues, but it's, it was nice for the application that we studied. So here's a comparison of the output of three different things. Um, this is on Tulare. I, this plot, I, this particular plot over here, I showed you earlier. Mm -hmm. This is the alpha complex, which is an approximation of the Torres Strips complex. And it was sort of getting some stuff, but not really. This is the adjacency complex, which at least visually looks like it's getting stuff. And this is a level set complex, which at least visually looks like it's actually picking up islands, which is what we want it to do. Mm -hmm. The adjacency complex is the one that intuitively we thought would be better, but for some reason, the level set complex, that seems to have been nicer for us. And then, not that it's easy to read these plots, but this is the barcode that you get for connected components and for, for, for holes in the alpha complex and the adjacency complex, which has strength of preference as the horizontal axis and the level set complex, which has time as a horizontal axis. So here we, you know, we start with these various, we start with a few different features. This is the number of components that we start with and we evolve. Oh, so uh, based in here, uh, XX is time? The... This X is time, yeah. So it's, it's, it's a PD is flowing and things are, things are filling in. I see. It's interesting. Yeah, so the, so this one on the left corresponds to if I were going to take just existing software and do something that one of the softwares does, this is the one that corresponds to one of the choices that you would see in software. Um, and the idea is that for our application, this is not picking up what we want. And adjacency complex is doing better. There's a, there's a table in the paper that actually indicates um, how many things we got right and wrong and so on, and also how long the computations took. And then the level set one, well, here I'm just showing you something visually that seems to have done what we want it to do. Sorry, I, I think I missed. So what, what does evolve in time for yeah, the yeah, level yeah. set method? So it means that I have a PDE uh -huh. and, I, and I am flowing and I'm, and I'm starting with an initial condition with these two things filled in, for example, uh -huh. and, I'm, and I'm doing front propagation according to this PDE. So, so there, is the, the, there is the orthogonal, there's the absolute value of the gradient. So this is, this is orthogonal to the surface and I have a velocity V and I'm flowing by that velocity through time. I see. Mm -hmm. So you mean the from the like a red region to the blue region, there is some flow thing happen? Like uh, it, it means it's it's front propagation. So it means that the entire region is expanding. So oh. this particular thing expands to this one. Mm -hmm. So it keeps expanding. So the purple re the two purple regions just expand as a function of time. You should think of it like like um, a mountain where the zero level set is at zero, and I'm and I'm moving down the mountain, and I'm going to thicker parts of the mountain. So, so you can think of this as being lower down the mountain as, as, as a lower height on the 3D surface and therefore it's thicker. And when does the, the barcode die and birth born? Um, yeah. The barcode is gonna die in the same, it's gonna be, it's gonna actually, that's gonna work the same way in the sense mm -hmm. that it's going to, so it's going, it's, 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 it's born when you see a feature topologically. So in dimension zero would be a connected component. So you'll notice that for this level set method, you know, there's, there's not, you're not getting new components except for the original one. Eventually you get one because we're discretizing. And so that causes um, some noise, basically. Like this is noise because we're discretizing. Um, so we don't have anything interesting in, in, in dimension zero because, mm -hmm. well, we just, we just had, you know, we just had a component that was, that was just there. Um, and then the holes, 
we started with a bunch of holes and and they eventually close and some of them take a long time to close and the interesting holes are actually the ones that start at the beginning i see thank you yep you're welcome okay so so one of the key points is that you need to worry about you know you can have you can have short persistence features if you're not measuring persistence in the right way. So in particular, some of the actual features, some of the holes, some of the islands like here are not occurring for long distance scales. And so if you just do the standard type of calculation, even if it shows up as an island, it's gonna show up as a short persistence, but actual feature, right? So, so, so it's breaking the notion of longer means it's feature and shorter means it's noise because you're not measuring it in the right way. If you then measure it in the right way, then you can go back to that kind of intuition. Okay, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about other spatial data and then I will get to COVID later on. Uh, so this is also work with Michelle. Um, this paper actually comes after the first one. It was published earlier because things go faster in physics than in applied math, but, but I'm presenting it in the order in, 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 in which the work was done. Okay, so I like this example. This is, this is a fun example. Having my coffee again. So we're going back to the spider webs. These are images. And um, this, this started, the story started in 1948 where there was this Swiss pharmacologist, Peter Witt. And his friend was having trouble sleeping because spiders were spinning webs at 2 a.m. I don't know what sound that would make, but apparently part of the story is he's having trouble sleeping. And so he asked, so, so Peter Witt's friend asked Peter Witt, you know, can you do something about this? And Peter Witt being the pharmacologist that he is, uh -huh. I would really love to reconstruct this whole conversation because I don't know how, it's really hard to tell exactly how this went about. But, you know, Peter Witt started just putting, giving drugs to the, spiders to see what would happen. He spent his entire career doing studying spiders in various ways. Uh -huh. um, and what he found is that their, their, their webs change depending on the drug. Although there's a long history of giving drugs to animals to see what happened. And then 50 years later, probably because they wanted to create Spider-Man or something. No, they, I mean, <laughs> um, NASA put some spiders up in space, expose them to various chemicals mm -hmm. to try to see um, what their webs look like. I think they were trying to find a substitute for doing things like um, chimpanzees. Um, and, and so the, there's, so we, we have a bunch of digitized images, some of them from Peter Witt and some of them from this one page NASA tech brief um, uh, of spiders. So you've got a drug-free spider, you've got a spider that had caffeine. This does not look like a normal web at all. A spider that had marijuana, it got some features. A spider that had speed, some features. A spider that had chloral hydrate. Chloral hydrate is a component of sleeping pills. So caffeine and sleeping pills seem to do all sorts of wonders to these webs. And what NASA concluded is that, well, more toxic chemicals resulted in more deformed spider webs. So I guess caffeine and sleeping pills. Um, so we, we um, have these images. Mm -hmm. And so we can use image data and we use the, the level set um, complexes. So um, just like starting at the locations of the spider webs, I think is where we is where we just have our initial our initial points and we then evolve a bunch of things. This particular one, I believe, is the one that I showed you. I think it was this one. It was one of these that I showed you earlier. Um, the pink circles are connected components. The blue squares are, are holes. Um, and you can, you, and you, and we're evolving, um, we're evolving through front propagation of these webs and seeing which structures evolve. Mm -hmm. And then what we do is that we take the, the, the blue squares only we have, we can measure, we're allowed to measure distances between different ones of these. So there's a way to measure, or there are multiple ways actually of measuring a distance between this object and that object. Um, I believe we used a type of Wasserstein distance. You can look up in the paper which one we use. Um, but then we have a pair, we have a distance matrix, a pairwise distances between these objects that you can then cluster to see what's related. And then we use average linkage clustering. So the drug-free spider ends up being in its own cluster if you have three clusters. 
and speed and sleeping pills and caffeine are in a cluster and marijuana peyote and LSD are in a cluster. Okay, this is a toy example. You really, you would want to do clustering on, on, on a data set with more than just seven things in it. Um, so uh, you cluster using the uh, barcode? No, we cluster using persistence diagrams. Uh, yeah, persistence diagram, I see. So how, how much measure, they are measure. similar? What's that? Uh, so using that persistent diagram, you perform the clustering? So you, so you measure persistence di distance between persistence diagrams, uh -huh. and there, there are different ways of doing it. So the start, oh, you, start going, you start going down a rabbit hole of choices that one might make. So there are papers that people write about what are good ways of measuring distance between this object and that object. I see. So, so we we were not trying to be innovative on the way of measuring distance. We just took a standard distance because uh -huh. we wanted to illustrate that our way of doing um, of constructing simplicial complexes was was picking things up. Um, this was, you know, so so the thing is, though, when you're doing hierarchical clustering for a real application, if you only have seven things, you wouldn't bother using that type of method normally. Right. Because you have seven things. <coughs> You would really want to use it on something where you have a much larger number of things. So there is um, a very nice, there's several very nice data sets. Um, in particular, there is a geographer, Jeff Boeing, who is at USC, who's made a lot of city street data sets from all over the world uh, available. And so we used a bunch of data sets from there, used, um, I forgot it was one kilometer by one kilometer or something like that squares from a certain part of it. And so we did those, we, we looked at the persistent, um, persistent homology of those in the same way as for the spider webs. But now we have a larger number and we do a clustering again. Um, and so one of the ways of dividing it up is that maybe you have grid-like cities where there's lots of those in North America, for instance, or you have interrupted grids and there's a bunch of those as well, or you may have some that are not grid-like as well, at all. Um, and to show you examples of what some of them look like, right? So the data set would look like this. So it's not the whole city, but it's actually a part of it. Los Angeles has a very boring map, <laughs> um, right? Um, wow. Then interrupted grids. There are two sub, two big subclusters for interrupted grids. Grids. So Aleppo is one, and Barcelona is another. And then there, the not grid-like. There were also two subclusters. There was one subcluster that only had. Um, two cities in it. Um, so Nanyang here is basically just the streets are so large in this particular block that there's not much there. And then London was one of the ones in the other one. Uh, here um, you use again the uh, level set method to- Yeah, we, we, use, the, we use the level set one, mm. yeah. So we start by having the streets be, um, be filled in. Mm -hmm. And then, and then as the front evolves, you fill in the stuff in between the streets. I see. Oh. OK. So now we're going to do this one. I don't have that much time. So oh, this yeah, is- Please a, go ahead. Don't worry about it. Yeah. OK. So th this is um, work <coughs> that is led by my current PhD student, Abby Hickok. And this is on spatial and now also spatial temporal. So we're going to also have time coming involved. So this leads to the word geospatial temporal. Um, anomalies using persistent homology, and then we're doing a couple different COVID-19 data sets. So there's going to be two types. I'm going to show you representations of, well, these aren't really representations of them. Hopefully you can see this. This is a um, plush COVID class of 2020 and plush vaccine. They actually, there's actually now a plush Omicron COVID. Um, you know, it's like, you might as well, you laugh to keep from crying, basically. Okay. So the data sets that we got, and because um, we're actually in conversation with LA County, so the, some of this data has come, has been assembled by the de um, Department of Health in Los Angeles County. I mean, they assemble public data, but the point is people who are experts, you know, put things together, um, which, which, which is important. So the two things that we looked at are per capita vaccination rates in different zip codes of New York City. This is on one day only. And this is fully vaccinated. I'm putting that in quote because I have to say what I mean. So this is before boosters. Mm -hmm. And so fully vaccinated meant that if it was, if it was a um, vaccine that required two doses, that means you had both doses. And if it was a vaccine that required one dose, then you had one dose. And it was, it was 
there was no two weeks after. So it was just that you had the doses. Okay, so that's the way the word was defined. And then the other one we do in this paper is case rates in different neighborhoods in Los Angeles. And so it's you know, understandable that we have richer data for LA because we've, we've been getting data from LA County. Um, and this is a running 14 day mean per capita case rate. So 14 days comes from partly from the time scales of the disease and partly just as a way to smooth out the data. Um, and we have this for 366 days. Nice. So it's including the 25th of April on both of those days. Um, I mean, we have more data now, but we didn't need to rerun it. Um, um, we submitted the paper originally in July or something. Okay, so, so this is gonna be in space and this is gonna be in space and time. And we're gonna use different constructions from what we did before. And I'm not gonna have time to explain the constructions. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about them, um, but they are using different methods. And again, defining constructions that we think are helpful for the um, application that we're thinking about. So here is a sort of toy version of, a, or not toy version, but here is a very fast illustration of a type of construction. And you can think of, I think like I showed it only in the first part, not in this particular colloquium part, but remember I was showing the, the border between Belgium and the Netherlands. It's in this paper that some of those issues show up. So we have a set of regions in the form of a shape file. So this is a bunch of regions from Los Angeles. Right. And so we, we need to construct them to respect the boundaries. So this blue thing right here, so this guy right there, our simplicial complex is going to be over here. So this in panel B is one simplicial complex. And um, if we look at this blue region, this blue region has a boundary of orange. So it has that. And then it has a boundary of purple. So it has that. And then it has a boundary of red. So it has that. Then it has a boundary of green, so there's a green, and then it has a boundary of outside. I see. So this one here is outside. So that's what makes it a pentagon. And then we need to triangulate it. So after we have the pentagon, we triangulate it. And then we need to think about, the, you know, when what does the green thing border? Well, the green thing borders the red and the outside and the blue, and the orange thing borders the blue and the outside and the purple. I see. And so, so we then, so, so this is a very different construction. And then we glue the boundaries together in a way that respects the geographical region boundaries and we get this, this particular object. Mm -hmm. Okay, but there are more complicated versions of this particular object. Mm -hmm. there, are, uh, there were some things that got very annoying. Um, so if we consider, um, and I did not actually choose this one for this talk, but we consider Koreatown. Uh, <laughs> this is not because of this talk, this actually was in the slides before. You see this pink thing. Uh -huh. You zoom in on this pink thing and you notice that it's yeah. the same connected component. And that matters, right? Because blue has to connect to pink and then to orange and then to pink again, mm -hmm. right? So we have to keep track of that. And so this one has a more complicated structure because of the fact that it's connecting to the same one again. Mm -hmm. So this particular object is our simplicial, our simplicial complex. And then we have to define filtrations in some way, which we do in a different way. So we're using the term sublevel set in a very different way from what we did before. So, so don't let the terminology get confusing. The, um, the functions that we consider, we either consider as a function vaccination rate, or we consider as a function case rate. So we consider the per capita vaccination rate. So this is our function F is either gonna be the per capita vaccination rate or it's gonna be the running 14 day mean and per capita case rate in LA. And we look for, depending on how we wanna do this, local minima or local maxima of that function. Because what we're trying to do is to find anomalies, right? Are you in a region that has a higher either case rate or vaccination rate in comparison to surrounding regions, right? So we have the simplicial complex, but then we have to put this function on it. Um, and whether you want a, a, a local min or a local maximum is going to depend on, do you want something that's hit less or do you want something that's hit more? Um, and then the reason that I'm showing these two, and I'm not, I know I'm doing this very fast at this point, is that this top panel is well separated, but the bottom panel is not well separated. So you, so you need to worry about some examples look like this, where two local maxima are actually 
you have the sort of base background there. And here two local maxima ha have, have a local minimum in between, right? So, so there's, a, there's, a, there's a qualitative difference mathematically between these two. Okay, so when we do this, so here each point corresponds, this is in New York, corresponds to a zip code. This was on one day and it has higher vaccination rates than its neighboring zip codes. Um, and um, so the idea, okay, so this is for New York, but the idea is something like, you know, maybe maybe Koreatown has a higher vaccination rate. So it would be, it would be a local maximum, for instance. Let's see. Okay, and then we, we give a symbol that pertains to, we label it based on what borough it's in. So New York has, I think it has, I thought it had seven boroughs, but, but anyway, there's five that are showing that we're keeping track of here. Um, and you'll see that, you know, this particular, so, so a particular zip code in the Bronx. Oh, I know what it is. I think there's a couple of islands that are like their own zip code or something that are just disconnected. I think, I think that's why, um, I think, and they're considered their own borough or something. I think that's why those are not there. Um, okay, so, so this is a particular zip code that's in the Bronx. So it's a blue star because it's in the Bronx. Um, and it's one zip code that lasted a very long time. But then these two zip codes in Manhattan, the structure didn't last very long. Okay, this slide is way too complicated, um, but let me just illustrate the point that I want to make. We now have things changing through time. I have not previously shown you an example with things changing through time. And so then the question is, well, how are we going to deal with it? And there are different choices that one can make. And so there are different papers that people have developed methods to do different choices. And the version that we use, or the thing we use is known as a vineyard, and you take persistence diagrams, so you take objects like this, and you move those as a function of something, which in our case is time. So you have these notions of, oops, you have these notions of a diagram like this moving through time, right? So think of this star moving through time. And, and, and so each stack is like one of those diagrams. And then you, and then you can color these vines based on, um, say which regions are you're keeping track of there. So it's, so this is hard to read, um, but you'll notice that the colors of the vines occasionally change. Um, and so, uh, oh, the other thing is when I, when I talk about COVID-19 anomalies, um, local max and local min, in an early version of the paper, we called them hotspots because that has, is what gives some intuition. But the CDC defines hotspots in terms of absolute numbers, and we are considering local min and local maxes, which is why we're using the term anomaly. Okay, but but intuition is hotspot-like intuition, except we're specifically doing local max and local min. Okay, so we're using something called vineyards to track these things through time. I appreciate that there's really no hope of understanding this slide in any real way, the way I'm doing this, but I, but I hope I'm at least giving a little bit of intuition. And so we can ask the most persistent anomalies, which anomalies last maybe the longest in some of these vines, for instance, or at a certain point. And so what we, here are the ones we end up finding. So this, is, this, of course, this has a lot less information on the slide, but is also a lot more, a lot more understandable. And the idea is that each of these highlighted regions was a local maximum, because that's why it showed up in the first place, for some subset of the time period. Right, so these are the ones that showed up the most for some subset of the time period. And what you would want to do in principle mm -hmm. is, is to say, okay, I have something that's moving in time and things are showing up a lot now. Mm -hmm. Can I look at something that's showing up a lot now and forecast later? And yeah. we, we haven't been able to make this you know, good enough to do that, but that's the type of thing that you would want to do is you'd want to see how things go in time now. So you look at an early part, um, maybe this red thing here, and you say, okay, well, maybe by having it show up now, that will tell us what's going on later. At least that's the hope. That's the type of thing you want to eventually do. We're not really there yet. This is really more of theoretical work in terms of method work, but that's what we really want to do. Okay, so I will give some conclusions. I appreciate the last part I went through very fast. 
Um, so topological data analysis, such as by computing persistent homology, can give insights into large scale structures, um, into various complex systems. And we looked at persistent homology of spatial and spatial temporal data. And one of the things that you can do if your data is in a smaller number of dimensions is that you can do a more systematic comparison between different types of constructions just because fewer things can happen. And so we're taking advantage of the fact that fewer things can happen and then looking at things in more detail as, as a result of that. So we were in 2D for, the, um, for instance, and so therefore we did a systematic comparison of different methods of construction. Mm -hmm. And so it's easier to do that in 2D than in 3D because, well, it's computationally less intensive. And again, there's just fewer things that can happen. And then one of our big um, messages is that you want to incorporate information from your application um, into how you construct things in the first place. Right? Mm -hmm. you, want to, you want to incorporate domain knowledge into these yes. constructions. And then, you know, one example of this is short persistent features versus short persistence noise. Mm -hmm. If you construct something in the wrong way, you are away from the paradigm that having more persistence means it's a feature and less persistence means it's noise. Mm -hmm. If you construct it in the right way, then you can go back to, to that paradigm. But, but you need to be really cautious about just putting something into available software and saying, oh, it's a long feature and therefore it's, 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 it's um, a feature. And it's a short feature, and therefore it's noise, right? You have to, we have to be careful and to not to not do that. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so that is it. Um, so thank you very much. Thanks so much, Mason. Uh, I think there. Uh...